Hi, this is Steve at blessedhopeforever.com. Let's have a word of prayer. Father, again, we come into your presence by means of our Lord Jesus Christ and in the Holy Spirit. So very thankful and grateful for the times in which we're living and for the opportunity you've given us to come together and feast upon your word. I just ask that the Holy Spirit would guide us into truth, all truth, nothing but truth. Seal to our hearts that which is truth, striking out, filtering out any error. For it's in Christ's name I pray. Amen. In this series, uh, we're studying, we've been studying together. Uh, verse by verse in the first epistle to the Corinthians and in our last study together we had approached the end of chapter 6 of first Corinthians chapter 6 I want to take a moment again and and I I do this I'm, I'm sure uh, far too often to stress again that we are studying God's Word this is God's Word and it's what the eternal, almighty, sovereign God wants us to know. Do we really believe that this is God's Word? Now, that's important because from chapter 7 on, much of this book seems to come from the mind of Paul. And uh, if you read many, uh, very many of the commentary. Terry's, uh, and, and you hear many sermons, listen to many sermons, you will hear the word Paul mentioned many more times than you'll hear the word Christ uh, mentioned. And this is going to become exceedingly important in chapter 7. Is this really God's Word? If it's Paul's Word, well, it, it's nearly... Uh, 2,000 years old and he had pretty funny views that that we in in our modern society we know or are, are well or think that are no longer valid and that excuse is used today and we have all kinds of those arguments because these are Paul's ideas this is uh, Paul's logic they are not Paul's ideas we have the personal pronoun occurring. We'll see it in chapter 7. I speak this by concession. You know, so that's Paul speaking, right? No, it is not Paul speaking. It is God. And if we really grasp that, that this book is serious. We ended the sixth chapter. Do you not know? Do you not know? that your plural body, singular, is the sanctuary of, of the Holy Spirit. And that, that word body can be this body of believers as part of the body of Christ. You know, it can be the entire body of Christ. And, and, and maybe, uh, you know, I mean, it would take some pushing to make it your own personal physical body. It's this body of believers that is the sanctuary of the Holy Spirit. Do we really believe that this is His sanctuary? And we have that in this group of believers and in believers all over the world. We have the Holy Spirit because God gave the Holy Spirit to us. He came and took up His abode in us. And we are not our own. We're not our own. Do you really believe that you're not your own? That you're God's? Because you've been bought with a price. You've been bought or are bought. It's an heiress passive. It's a statement of absolute fact. It is a finished condition. You are bought with a price. And we could probably spend an entire week. In fact, probably we could probably spend an entire month just talking about that amazing wonderful fact do you really believe 
Have you really grasped the fact that God Almighty became your kinsman redeemer and He died in your place? That the price that He paid for you was His death on the cross, being made sin for you, being made sin in your place, so that sin has no power over you. What a marvelous truth. You've been bought with a price. To me, it's unbelievable that the Holy Spirit said it so simply. He could have said, you know, you've been bought with an amazing price. You've been, uh, he could have said a mega price, you know, an ultimate price. You know, any adjective that you can think of that might have uh, tried to point out the magnitude of that price. And I personally believe that there's, there's none there because there isn't one that's fitting and, and I'm afraid that far too many Christians take it just that casually. So we've been bought with a price. I got my job to worry about. I got my home to worry about. My animals, you know, to worry about. My, my, my Jeep to worry about. My, my wife to worry about. I got all these things to do. There's the constant battle to take my mind, my desire, my affection, my off of Christ. You're bought with a price. Therefore, since that's, that is absolutely true, glorify God in your body. And again, that's singular. This body of believers, the body of Christ, in your spirit, which belongs to God. You belong to Him. Now, somebody put a chapter break there, and, and I, I know I'm in trouble. You know, the reason I'm in, in trouble is because I can't find anybody that agrees with me. And, you know, and you can laugh or, or make light of that. I, I don't. I think every one of us, if we come to some conclusion about a verse, if we come to some conclusion about Scripture uh, that isn't very strongly su supported, uh, maybe we ought to seriously consider our position. And, and, uh, and I've been trying to do that for years here on this channel. In fact, I've been trying to do that for years, ever since I be became a student. Of God's Word but, but had I been the person that did it and I, and I don't know who did it I, and I don't want to suggest that it's inspired uh, you know where I stand on the sovereignty of God and, and I don't want to and I I don't want to suggest that God had nothing to do with it but somebody put chapters and verses in there somebody did and I sort of like that because one when one of you reads me uh, scripture, or if one of you quotes me a verse, it's nice to know where to go in, in this book to find it. And we do that with chapters and verse. The problem is, we put a chapter break here, folks, and immediately our minds are now snapped violently away from the end of chapter 6. Don't you know, don't you know that your body is the sanctuary of the Holy Spirit? You know, whether it's your personal body or this body of believers, I personally, I think it's this body of believers. I think it's the body of Christ. But either way, don't you know, don't you know that, that you were bought with a price? stated so simply but so absolutely amazing you know what God did so that you are sinless in his sight you stand before him holy unblameable and unreprovable in his sight that that heaven is absolutely assured 
that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory that shall be revealed in us. Chapter break. Now, concerning the things whereof you wrote unto me. And so, and so we stop. You know, you, you see these believers wrote to Paul, and Paul's now answering their letter. And, and so it's, you know, our ideas, this is, it's all, this is Paul. This is, we're, we're listening, we're reading, we're hearing Paul, Paul. It's all about Paul. Paul, Paul, Paul. So these are Paul's thoughts. This is Paul's logic. So the sense of this chapter is now the sexual activities of wife and husband. You, you suppose, since we believe this to be God's Word, that God decided after the close of chapter 6, after the wonder of what we've been looking at there, that we're now going to discuss sexual relations between husband and wife. Dearly beloved, is, is that all that this chapter contains? That's my question. That would be my question to you. Now concerning the things whereof you wrote to me, am I suggesting that believers at Corinth did not write to Paul? Not at all. Not at all. I think clearly they did. That They wrote to Paul. In fact, we're going to see the same expression several times as we go on in our study here in Corinthians. But that does not mean in any way that this is not the Word of God. Did Paul write it? Did Paul write it? I, folks, I've never suggested he didn't, but I strongly tell you that he did not author it. He didn't author it. And we don't have the letter that they wrote to Paul. Uh, whether it exists or not, I don't know. We don't know whether he wrote them other letters, but we do have what God wants us to know. We do have what God wants us to know. He washes us by the Word. We don't understand how important this book is, folks. This is God's Word. I, I don't know how to tell you, I've mentioned this many times, I don't know how to put it into words. I don't know how to tell you what a privilege it is for you to have, to, to be able to hold in your hands what God Almighty wants you to know. If this is Paul's word and Paul's ideas, they're time limited. They're time oriented. If it's God's word, it's timeless. If you really believe, in fact, this, the simplest response I ever heard, you know, uh, to a lady who was arguing for her authority to be a pastor of a church, the man answered, you know, and it, it wasn't me, I, I heard this fellow answer. Well, it makes it clear to me that you don't believe God's Word. And it's that simple but she believed it was Paul's Word. She believed it, this was Paul's Word. And many do. It, it was Paul's idea. It's Paul's Word. Uh, Paul, awful Paul. He didn't like women anyway. Now, I don't know that, but I never look at this as Paul's Word. And I don't think you should either. The Holy Spirit has Paul write the things you wrote to me, and here's one statement of God Almighty. Here, here's one clear statement by God Himself. I don't know what Paul might have preached when he got there. I know what God wrote. I know what he wrote. It is good for a man not to have sexual relations with a woman. That's, that's what it says. That's what it says. Well, that, it could be saying, as some suggest, that a man shouldn't run around having uh, sexual relationships with women. That could be what the text is saying. But folks, 
that ought to be intuitively obvious, and the Holy Spirit didn't need to tell us that in this verse. We already know that such activity is sin. The works of the flesh are manifest, which are these, and you know, I'm sure you've read those. Adultery, fornication, uh, lasciviousness. It's clearly pointed out. We didn't need that statement here. So this is simply a statement that it is good for a man not to be married. That's what the text says. Now, many people get around that. We, you know, we jump ahead in the chapter. I, I suppose for the present distress, and, and, and they make the present distress the persecution that existed while Paul was alive. So we're just looking at it in something that took place in historical time here. Why isn't the present distress today also? Okay, Are you to suggest to me that you have no conflict of the flesh? I've had many of you write to me and tell me about that. I've expressed my own concerns about that, that, that you have no battle between flesh and spirit, that you face no temptations and you, you don't face any difficulties in your life, that there's no distress, pr presently, present tense, no distress. This is just historical. Dearly beloved, you are in present distress. Who shall separate us from this mess, this distress? Jesus Christ. Well, if we said that, are we then saying that men should not get married? Okay, uh, if we could get all men convinced of that, well, then it would solve the population explosion. Yes. Rather quickly. So it can't be saying that. And yet, this is God's Word. Dearly beloved, you have a life. Some man and woman got together and conceived you. Your parents had a life. They, they conceived you. Whoever you are, you were born, educated, in whatever, whatever position, whatever station you are in life right now, you're there. Are you God's? And was He in control in directing you in all stages of that development? I believe He was. That's what the, this word says. It says that He controls our steps, directs our steps. Uh, so you get you got married and after you got married uh, well, what I'm leading up to is that since I belong to God and since he paid an amazing price for me that, that, that you can't find an adjective to describe and if I really comprehend that and if my greatest desire is service to Him, then the best thing is for me not to marry. It's that simple. And that's what this text is saying. It's not forbidding marriage. Okay? And it, it, it has nothing to do with sexual promiscuity or anything like that. It's good that a man not marry. Okay? His... Jesus' disciples said almost something like that to Christ in Matthew chapter 19. If this be the case of a man with a woman, it is better not to be married. And Christ said every man has his proper gift. I believe that word there is grace, charis, grace. I may not... But there are those who are not married because they're forced not to marry. There are those who are not married because... Well, I mean, they have the ability to marry, but there's something uh, physically wrong with them or mentally wrong with them or whatever. But there are those who do not marry in service for God. And that's a big step. 
I do not think the text is saying every, every man should never marry. I don't think the text is saying that at all. I want to be clear on that. That's why the text uses kalos, the word there in the Greek. It's a better thing not to marry. I don't think I've stressed that text at all. That text is not telling you not to engage in prom promiscuous sex. That's just obvious. We know that. Everybody knows that that's wrong. It's fine for a man to marry. It's good for a man to marry. The Lord Jesus Christ said that every man has his proper gift or grace. So then, how do we knit this together with, uh, with Genesis 18? You know, it's good for a man not to touch a woman, and it, it's not good that the man should be alone. Again, folks, I don't think this text is saying no man should marry. Please don't misunderstand me doesn't say that. I think the higher calling is no chapter break. I'm bought with a price. I'm trying to get rid of that chapter break, folks. I've been bought with a price, and I'm to glorify God in my body and in my spirit. I want to live my life for the Lord. I'm not saying anything bad or negative about marriage, especially not Christian marriage. Absolutely nothing bad about marriage. Christ said every man has his proper gift. If your gift is to get married, by all means get married. I'm not arguing against marriage. I'm, what I am saying and what I believe the text is saying that a higher calling, there's a higher calling, is that He bought me with a price, an amazing price. He owns me. I'm His. And I want my whole entire life to be devoted to Him, my whole life to be His. It won't be, folks, if I marry. I'm sorry. Okay? All right. I'm sorry. It won't be. When I was 32 years old, I asked the Lord to so use me more than any man had ever been used more than Paul. But that was the enthusiasm of, my, of, of youth. I really, really wanted to be the next Apostle Paul. And I, I turned out to be a mess. But the Lord directs my steps. And I really wanted to do that. But then I married. I married. And I believe I married the most perfect woman that God had for me most perfect woman he ever made and there's never been another one like the, the woman that I have but man it's been a lot of work let me tell you all right I'll tell you many times I was much more concerned about my wife than I was about Christ and I don't think that you can get away from that the married man cares how that he may please his wife. That's Scripture. And it was sure true in my life. And I'm sure it's true in, in many of yours, your lives. I, I hate to say this, but after 34 years in this book and working with those who profess to know Christ, even in the body of Christ, even in the body of Christ, most men... I know would rather not be married. And most women I know who are single, they want to be married. Isn't that amazing? In fact, somebody once came to me and said, you know, Steve, I, I don't really, I don't like the Scripture talking about Christ and the church as, as man and wife because I don't see very many happy marriages. And I, and I said, I don't see very many happy Christians. I think that's true. We make a lot out of marriage. And as you well know, you know, we have huge marriage seminars. I mean, these 
big major events, you know. They're there to study marriage and sex and dating. Not Bible, not doctrine, not doctrine. Ephesians 5, why submit yourselves to your own husband? This is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. Is, is that really a document from the Holy Spirit on how you live your life? Is that a, a manual, a, a textbook on, on, on how you live your life? Or, or is it a testimony, a message of what God has done for us in Christ Jesus? I'm simply saying, I believe this text says the highest calling is to dedicate yourself totally to the Lord. You know, and this, this is one of the texts used for celibacy in the Roman church. You know, or, or monks up on a mountaintop or, or, or whatever. But, but, they, but they made a fetish out of it. If that's the word to use. I, Christ says every man has his proper gift or grace. I'm absolutely, absolutely convinced my gift, my grace was to get married. Even though in earlier days I decided the rest of my life, all I'm going to do is live for Christ. No distractions, no worries, no other responsibilities until the Lord placed a wife in my life. And my proper gift was to get married. And for you husbands, uh, all you husbands out there, I don't believe that you'd be married if God did not want you to be married. Nevertheless, to avoid fornication, let every man have his own wife and let every woman have her own husband. Verse 2. The text now is quite clear that these are singulars, And uh, this is probably the most important text. It's not the only one, but it's the most evident one that, that, that teach a one husband, one wife union. You know, now, David had several wives, and, and, and Solomon, well, he, he had a bunch of them. There were those who apparently had only one wife in the Old Testament. But surely a great number had more than one. It, it must also be true. In the days when Christ was here, when He was here and, and, and walked among us, and the Scriptures tell us that a bishop should be the husband of only one wife, so, so it seems to me the ideal that's uh, presented, that's set forth in the Scriptures, is one woman, one man. And, and I think that's why that these are singular. The purpose being to avoid moral evil. Let every man have sexual relations with his own wife, and every woman have sexual relations with her own husband. Now, now, now we're getting, well, you know, rather personal. And if you want to make this, folks, just physical for a moment, and, and I, I don't, I don't. I believe that we're looking far beyond just the physical relationship of man and woman. You know, I, I, couldn't, I couldn't wait to point that out. But we're looking at the relationship that we have with Christ and the church. All right? And that never seems to be done with this passage of Scripture. Now, we just have the marriage seminars, just to, and they pass out the handbooks on how to you know, do stuff. This moral evil could also be spiritual evil, folks, to avoid idol worship and all of those kinds of things. Then every man should have his own wife and every wife her own husband. 
a unique relationship as our relationship with Christ and the church ought to be. That's the way to avoid spiritual fornication. And I've talked a little about that. And it seems to fit the context very well. There are any number, more than most of us are willing to admit, cases of infidelity in a Christian marriage. Because either the wife or the husband didn't perform their obligation. And it's quite clear in the next few verses. Verse 3. Let the husband render unto the wife due benevolence, and likewise also the wife unto the husband. Uh, if we keep reading verse 4, the wife hath not power over her own body, but the husband, and likewise also the husband hath not power of his own body, but the wife. Uh, I guess just we should keep on reading verse 5. Defraud ye not one the other. Let the husband render. It's a present imperative. It's a command unto the wife. Her due. Her, her philo. Okay? In the Greek. It's what's due her. What is her right? And if he doesn't do that, she might look elsewhere. And if she doesn't do it, he may look elsewhere. And, and, and uh, more than can be possibly understood, that's the case in many a Christian marriage. It's, it's the case in many a marriage in general. But even among Christians. For a wife who really does her due and a husband who really does his due very, very seldom is there ever any infidelity. So, I'm suggesting that physical infidelity starts by one of the partners not actually performing what is the, the right of the other partner. You see, the husband ought not to think of himself. He ought to think what his wife's rights are. What is, what is due his wife. And she, likewise, she should not think of herself, but what is her husband's rights are. What is due her husband. But, oh, oh no, oh, no, no. We, no, we had an argument. You know, you're not going to sleep in the bed tonight or you're not going to sleep on the couch or something like that. And this stuff goes on all the time. Goes on all the time. A Christian couple came to me once, and, and you know, and I'm going to close with this. I, 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 I shouldn't even tell you. You know, we have a problem, and and I and and wondered if you could help. I said, well, I'll do the best I can. Well, my wife won't wash dirty diapers, and we have a baby, and I left for work. And there was this, uh, there was a huge bag of dirty diapers li lying around, and I collected it all up. I gathered it up, and uh, I put it all. I put them in a wash room, and I told my wife, I said, when I when I get home, I I'd like to have all those diapers washed. And he said, Well, I went to work, and I worked all day, and I came home. And they weren't washed. And I had a collection of, of old phonograph records. You know, they're, they're basically going, they're, they're going out of date. And I, and I had what I thought was a really, really elegant collection of outstanding uh, albums uh, and records. And every one of them was broken into. So I, I just, I simply went up and I got all of her good dresses and I cut them in half. And I thought, these are Christians. I mean, dearly beloved, don't you know that you've been bought with a price? That you're His? 
are your rights and your pleasures that great? You see, if we forget a story like that, Bert, verse 3, Christ is going to render what's due us. Are we going to render what's due Him? It is so easy, dearly beloved, to lose sight of the bigger picture. I do not think that the Holy Spirit here is primarily interested in writing a sex manual, okay? But in highlighting the obligations of the relationship that we have with Jesus Christ and His body. We criticize other Christians. We, we cut them to pieces. That's not their right. That's not their due. We're to, we're to love one another from a pure heart, fervently. And our eyes, our focus, our attention, our eyes should always be on Christ. And the minute we get into these, these things, our eyes go off of Christ. And we're looking someplace else. May the Lord Jesus Christ be glorified. And may we be excited to live for as long as the Lord would have us here. The life that is, is Christ. I thank you all for all of your wonderful comments, for your participation with us in these studies. Obviously, as, as you know, as we're still here. I just got word this morning that they've begun uh, some, a group of rabbis have gotten together and begun construction of the third temple. And they did that yesterday the anniversary of Israel's independence. There's also a news bulletin about the uh, never-before-seen uh, mysterious uh, waves of in, in the Sea of Galilee of such strength that uh, it's unprecedented. You might want to check into those, those two uh, ideas. I also want to remind you that uh, today is this should be published on May 15. We've got a blood moon. Uh, I invite you to look us up too on Facebook, Blessed Hope Forever on face, Facebook, uh, where I post regular updates. Thank you for all your love, your prayers, your, especially for the direction of this ministry. I love you all. I truly do. Until next time, this is Steve. Thanks for watching.